Uh, Richard, before the break, we were talking about the the culture in in Afghanistan and, and how different it is is to ours. But the one thing that that comes across in your book and and from other people I've spoken to who've served in Afghanistan is the hospitality, that the warmth of the people. I mean, it's quite interesting that that, that the culture is one of hospitality, that wherever you go, you are given hospitality. And I think that's partly to do with the rugged terrain, um, partly to do with being a mountain people, and partly the the history and the culture of the area. I I find it sometimes rather embarrassing because you'd go to these villages that were incredibly poor, um, and they would always invite you in uh, for a cup of tea and some bread, and then you might get invited for a meal. And you knew that if if you accepted that they were going to take a very precious sheep or, or goat and, and, and slaughter it for the meal. Uh, and this was a very scarce res- resource that they were wasting on us, who had actually got plentiful supplies of food. Uh, and so there was this sort of ritual of refusing and being asked again. And you got to a stage where if you had, uh, sort of the etiquette appeared to be that if you were asked for the third time, by that stage it was getting rude to refuse. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, everywhere I went, uh, we were met with hos- with this hospitality. I mean, there were some areas where there'd been one or two issues that we needed to resolve, but that hospitality underpinned everything that they did. And and yet, there are the insurgents who are trying to kill you. I mean, they're they're, they're putting out devices that that will blow up your convoys and and suicide bombers. What's the relationship between these hospitable people who who welcome you into their homes? and these people who, who don't want you there at all? Well, I think uh, primarily there was an ethnic split. Uh, and if you went into the town of Duarby up in that northeast corner, and I say town, probably being a bit generous to it, uh, that level of hospitality um, was not quite so great. I mean, people were not so welcomingly, uh, welcoming, open to you. Uh, but they would still invite you in for the cup of tea because that was what the custom demanded. Uh, and so it was a natural response that if you engaged with them, you would be invited in for a cup of tea. Is it hard to be professional and step away from sometimes things that, that are horrible, devastating? I think one of the um, benefits of military training is that you have various standing operating procedures or routines, part of which is to take kick in when things go wrong so that the procedure takes over so you're doing things without necessarily thinking on a wider basis of what it is that you're actually actually dealing with Um, and so that's always at the background i think also though you know soldiers are are human beings and actually often even the toughest roughest soldier has a very soft heart Uh, and you see that how soldiers interact with young kids and people that actually need support and help yeah, at one point you talk about uh, a bunch of soldiers who, who are playing was it volleyball with, with a, a group of local youngsters. Yep. And it seems to be that, rather than all the diplomacy and all the other stuff that's going, all the official stuff, it's actually that simple sport that, that actually broke the ice. Well, I think you know, any way that we can engage and, and get that interaction going is great. And I think you know, one of the... Uh, one of the advantages of Kiwi soldiers is that they're used to working in different cultures and their ability to create rapport with people. Uh, and it does provide that sort of upswell of, of popular support. Of course, I mean, the difference between New Zealand soldiers who are there and, and maybe the US or the British troops who are there is that New Zealand is there as part of the reconstruction end of the operation as opposed to being part of the military side. Do people make the... Do Afghans make the... the the distinction between New Zealand's New Zealanders and Americans, or, or no. they're all Westerns. I mean, we're, we're all part of ISAF. Um, we're all there, actually, with the same goal, which is to prevent the Taliban achieving its objectives, both political and, and military. And we're just doing a particular piece of the jigsaw puzzle that needs to be done. Um, if I take um, the, both the Brits and the Americans, have actually got PRTs themselves. So you know, within their forces, they've got mm. the full spectrum of, of activities that are taking place. And, and of course, you've also got aid organisations, NGOs working yep. there. Is it hard to work in with, with non-military people who, who have a completely different mindset to the way aid should work? 
most of the NGOs are there for an enduring period. I mean, they see the military as coming in very quickly, doing some stuff and, and, and yeah. getting out, whereas they, they will be there for 20, 30 years. Uh, and then the other thing that sort of puts a bit of a complexity over it is that they are often very much based in the communities doing local community-based projects, uh, whereas the majority of the projects that we were doing were sort of province-wide building provincial infrastructure. So we're coming at a similar problem, but from a different perspective, I suppose. Mm. Uh, and there were certainly times um, where th that friction caused irritation, certainly <laughs> on my side. I mean, <laughs> Unama um, has the unenviable task of trying to coordinate everything. And even trying to get the NGOs to say what they were doing was hard enough. I tried to take a view that we should be transparent, that um, Clearly, there were some security operations I wasn't going to be transparent about. Um, but in terms of our development work, um, that we should be quite happy to tell people what we're doing. And one of the things I tried to uh, move towards the end is actually getting our development plans agreed by the provincial officials as the plan for the province that we were doing on their behalf rather than just doing on our own behalf. So I was pushing that transparency as much as I could. Um, some of the uh, NGOs were not necessarily wanting to engage in that sort of activity. Mm. You're home now. One of the most interesting pages is almost the one at the end where you talk about what it's like to be back home. So what is it like to be back home? I think um, when I first arrived, we talked about the culture shock of going to Afghanistan. The culture shock of coming back was almost greater, <laughs> funny enough, um, because you become so immersed in, in this, this small community uh, and become such a part of it and became so emotionally wrapped up in it, to suddenly be back in Auckland walking around people whose views on the world were, were, were on what <laughs> in relative terms are fairly minor issues was, was just huge. Um, and I think there was also that s sense of strangeness at walking up uh, Queen Street to go to work with amongst all of these people who had no idea what I'd been doing um, what, and couldn't probably comprehend it even if I'd stopped and talked to them. So I found coming back more difficult than, than going. Would you get back? I would love to be able to contribute in some way or another to Barmian and the development of Barmian. It has been fascinating to meet you and fascinating to meet you read your book. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks.